When the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea addressed the Parliament today, he spoke of the strong bond between our countries, as Laura just referred to. He opened his speech with the story of a leader from the highlands of PNG speaking to politicians in Canberra back in the 1950s. He made a speech in his own mother tongue because he knew no English. And he drew some laughter from the crowd. And he made a statement that is quite sentimental and historic. He said, today I come to you and speak to you in my language and you laugh at me. One day my son will come to you and speak in your language and you will certainly listen. Today as I stand before you in your wonderful house, this prophecy is being fulfilled. I spoke to the Foreign Minister Penny Wong just a little earlier. Penny Wong, welcome to 7.30. Good to be with you. Um, we saw a very different scene to the one described there. Mm. Why has it taken so long to have a PNG Prime Minister address us? Well, that's probably a question about our history, isn't it? But what I can mm. say is I thought that was a wonderful speech today, a really important moment for our nation as well as for Papua New Guinea. Uh, it was uh, gracious and respectful and taught us something about our, who we are, taught us about Papua New Guinea and it taught us about our shared history. Uh, so I thought it was a it's a beginning of a, a different stage in our relationship and it was uh, very, very, I was very humbled to be witness to it. Now, only a few months ago, we understand that PNG was reportedly considering an offer from the Chinese to assist with policing, I think is the phrase that was used. How would Australia respond to Chinese police running operations with our closest mm -hmm. neighbour? Mm -hmm. Well, for the first point I'd make is that the Foreign Minister, Justin Tachenko, has clarified those remarks. Uh, but more broadly, uh, you know, I think I said at the National Press Club last year, you know, China will continue to be mm. China and it's a great power. It will continue to assert its interests and utilise its power to press for those interests. And clearly, it sees one of those interests as engaging in the security sector in the Pacific, including policing. We saw under the Morrison government the mm. Solomon Islands arrangement and we, we continue to see Chinese police in the Solomon Islands. But if Austra it, if Austra it, if it, Australia's yes. position is that the stability of the Pacific is best served by these security needs being provided within the Pacific family. Let me talk some more about China. Mm. Um, Dr Yang Hanjun's suspended sentence was really a frightening development. Have you spoken to his family? Uh, not as yet. Uh, I obviously uh, have previously uh, and you know, remain very willing to engage uh, when, when they are ready and I can imagine they are extremely distressed, mm. uh, we, as I said on the day, uh, and that, that it was harrowing news. Was it, were you blindsided by it? Uh, look, uh, I think we, we made clear the verdict we, we thought was appalling. Uh, as the Prime Minister said, we, we were outraged mm. and we will... Uh, advocate, continue to advocate for that and be frank in our views about uh, you know, that sentence and we, we will not forget Dr Young. Now, at the same time, there are... Uh, the, I think the question is, what is this sentence hmm. trying to do? I mean, there's clearly been some reporting in China that there are harsher sentences, particularly within the apparatus of the Chinese security services. So is this exceptionally hard sentence also about sending a message to people who would criticise the regime, or is it in any way targeted at Australia? Do you know any more about why it, why it came about? I, I don't think it's helpful to Dr Young or necessarily for Australia's national interests for the Foreign Minister to mm. engage in that sort of... Um, you know, those sorts of hypotheticals. What I would say is this, it's obviously a very different legal system. Uh, uh, we, we in Australia have a view about... You know, uh, the sentence, we, we think it is appalling uh, and we have expressed that view very clearly. Uh, we will you know, obviously uh, continue to engage to support Dr Young, uh, give him, provide him with consular support, uh, make representations uh, about his condition and his medical treatment and so forth. You said it was harrowing, it's not language we're used to hearing from you. Well, uh, it, it was. It was harrowing. I think so. Mm. I think it was. Uh, I think we all know Australians have a view about the death penalty, uh, and to have an Australian uh, uh, subject to a death pen a suspended death mm. penalty, I think people were shocked. Let me let me move on to the Middle East. Overnight, Israel has rejected mm. um, Hamas's demand 
uh, for a four and a half months ceasefire to accompany any potential hostage release. Did that decision by Israel surprise you? Look, what I would say is the international community has made its view clear. I think 153 countries, including Australia, voted for immediate humanitarian ceasefire. We want the hostages returned. We want humanitarian aid in. Uh, we want civilian lives protected. Uh, so, you know, I, I've seen what Tony Blinken has said. I, we have been supporting what they and others in the region, including the Qataris mm -hmm. and other countries of the region, have been doing because uh, we, we do need to see progress on both the release of the hostages and also uh, aid being able to get in. Uh, we, we are deeply concerned about, you know, the, human, the loss of life mm. uh, and the diminishing safe space for Palestinians in Gaza. Let me ask you this. Does the US and its allies, obviously including Australia, have mm. any influence at all in how the Netanyahu government is conducting this war? Well, all, what I can do uh, is to uh, use Australia's respected voice to advocate for peace. So we're not a major power, a great power no. in the Middle East. We're not a participant. Mm. We're not obviously part of the Middle East. Uh, and what countries ultimately do or what play, you know, various states or uh, entities do is a matter for them. But we are a respected voice and we should use it to advocate uh, that pathway to peace. Notwithstanding the genuine outrage that, that occurred over the Hamas massacres mm. in, in October, is there any point at which the Australian government might consider sanctions against Israel for the conduct of the war? Look, I, I wouldn't speculate on sanctions for any country. Uh, what we, from the beginning, though, I have been consistent. You might recall the, the very first time I said anything about this. I called for restraint uh, and protection of civilian lives. I was criticised for that by Mr Dutton. Uh, but that should be Australia's consistent position. We, we accept, uh, uh, as a matter of international law, uh, uh, Israel's... Uh, right to defend itself. I mean, I think that's the question. Is there is there a line in your understanding of international law that Israel cannot cross in its pursuit of what it describes as total war? Well, uh, I would say that the international community has made its views crystal clear, uh, including with the vote at the United Nations that Australia, Canada and New Zealand were part of calling for an international humanitarian ceasefire. It's not the I would say I would say well I would say I would say the well, line is I, I would say that the international community has made its position clear when Canada, Australia and New Zealand mm. issued a joint statement uh, speaking of how alarmed we are at the diminishing safe space for Palestinians and again uh, uh, calling on Israel to ensure that it protects civilian lives. I think that question about the safe space is, is very important right now, and particularly given that uh, the phrase used by Netanyahu that is continuing with total war, when we know that that total war is currently focused on that area in the south where a very large number of people have moved. So it is inevitable that we're going to see continued very high casualties if the war continues in that area. Which is why we support and we, we, we urge there to be uh, the negotiations that require, are required for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire and steps toward a sustainable ceasefire. Is, essentially, is the rest of the world powerless to protect Palestinian civilians? Well, uh, what I would say is it is a, a, a dreadful, I've described it as a, um, a, a disastrous humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Uh, ultimately, uh, what we need to see brokered uh, is a humanitarian ceasefire and we need a pathway to peace which includes a pathway to a two-state solution. One of the things I would say that struck me uh, when I was in the Middle East in my recent visit uh, was uh, the, the truth of this, that there is no end to the conflict in the Middle East without a Palestinian mm. state alongside an Israeli state. I want to move on to... Uh, to UNRWA, what is the evidence that you have cited about mm. the involvement of UNRWA staff in the attacks? Well, we, we have. Well, I make two points. Um, there are two, I think, irrefutable truths about UNRWA. The first is it is necessary to provide 
uh, support and assistance to Palestinians in Gaza. And right now, I think that, well, UNRWA is saying that they can keep is, going in the current yeah, setup is, until the end is, of February. It is. It is. There is not another organisation mm. which can provide humanitarian assistance on the ground in the way UNRWA does. So, truth number one. Truth number two is that the allegations are serious and they can't simply be ignored. So when you say they're so, serious, what are you basing Well, the, no, no, I'll, 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 I'll come to that. Mm. They're, they're serious and they can't be ignored. Now, we have written to the... We have spoken to the Israelis mm. and we have asked for further evidence, but I think it is clear from UNRWA's own actions that they regard these allegations as serious. I mean, they have taken action, including terminating the employment of a number of employees and, in, and putting in place an inquiry. In fact, there are two inquiries. Yes. Now, I, I have spoken, in fact, today... Mm to Mr Lazzarini, Philippe Lazzarini, who's the head of UNRWA, and also to Sigrid Karg, who's the UN coordinator for assistance. And what did, what did Mr and, Lazzarini and, tell you today? Well, what I, what I, why, why I wanted to speak to them was because we do want to find a way through. Mm. But I just want to stay with the basis for your decision. You spoke to him today. Um, are you now in possession of all the information you need no, we've sorted, to underpin No, we've sorted, but... but the allegations are serious enough and UNRWA has recognised that yes, by its own actions. Indeed, so, but that, so, those so, allegations have now been in the world for a number of days yes. and you took a very serious decision along with other countries oh, just, to suspend our aid. So, no, so no, hang on, hang on. Let's be, be careful. Yes. Be careful. We, 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 uh, we have already doubled... Yes, but you've, sus no, no, you've let, suspended let me finish. the additional aid. No, because aid. I know that some wish to... Um, you know, I've seen some of, of, of the misinformation that's been put out by some of um, some other politicians. We doubled the operating assistance to UNRWA, OK? And that, that was already provided. Uh, I announced six million for the, the, I suppose, the flash appeal. Uh, subsequently, we saw these allegations. I, along with other countries, made a decision and it is a decision I made to pause that mm -hmm. uh, uh, because the allegations were serious and because UNRWA itself recognised that those allegations let's, were serious. Let's, let's, uh, if I may, I just want to come back to the point I'm making, which is that decision was made a number of days ago. We know there are reports no, I, now... Yeah, and I have, we have sought further information yes. from the Israelis. So is that good enough? We are, we are days well, past that information being raised. We're now seeing reports, including from well, the UK, overnight that the information contained in the dossier that mm. was provided by the Israelis is flimsy. What is it that you know that makes you confident that you made the right decision? No, well, because UNRWA itself acknowledged that those allegations were serious. And I think it is incumbent upon me as Australia's foreign minister to ensure that every dollar of aid that we provide uh, is being used for the appropriate purposes. But if there is... If, if the Israelis... Uh, I haven't seen all of the, the British reporting that mm. you describe, and there's a lot of reporting, uh, but it, if the Israelis, uh, the Israelis can answer uh, about questions about their evidence. It's not my evidence. But that, when that you is, spoke to Mr respect. Lazzarini today, oh, presumably he's in full possession of, of the information oh. that was made available. And, and Did you he, ask him for it? And, uh, uh, well, I, I've, uh, we've asked the Israelis for it. Did you ask Mr Lazzarini uh, well, for it? Well, he, he and I it. are focused on... He and I are focused on... Uh, my conversation with him focused on how we work through these issues so that confidence can be restored, not just for Australia. I understand. Well, no, let I, me finish. Yeah, like, I understand just that because that's this important. Is, I understand that's that, very that's important. That's actually what's important to people on the ground, is how do we restore confidence? So Australia, Canada, Japan and others are in a position uh, to provide further funding to UNRWA. Still, that is what, what yes. matters. Uh, well, and we'll, in, a minute, in a moment we'll come quickly to the question of the restoration of the funding, but I just want to stay with my question, which is you spoke to the head of UNRWA today. Yes. He has already initiated well, he, an it, internal review. Yes. He has the information. Well, Why wouldn't you ask him for it? Well, it's, uh, we have asked the Israelis for it. But you spoke to the head of UNRWA. Well, he hang has on, it. hang on. That's, well, uh, he may... I don't know what he has. He what he and I discussed, well, what he and I have discussed was staff. the two processes that he's undertaken uh, and we will stay in close contact with UNRWA about those processes. Well, let's, let's just, then, to, to conclude on this, let's, uh, I want to ask you a question about that because UNRWA have said in the last mm. few days, I think, that they have enough funding to last until the end of February or the beginning of mm. March. The funding that's been suspended amounts to half of their entire funding, which brings me back to the question, 
it's they're facing a very serious yeah. situation and you're not in full possession of the facts. Uh, well, uh, no, we're not. Uh, but what I would say is the primary um, concern is making sure that other donors, particularly those who have not provided their next round of operational funding, core funding, uh, that that confidence can be uh, attained before the end of the month. So, are you going to wait? For well, that's we, that's we have already. Well, no, no, that we 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 have already provided that funding previously. So there are other donors uh, whose next round of operational funding is required, and so it's in UNRWA's interest uh, for there to be sufficient confidence for those decisions to be made. Um, Penny Wong, thank you very much indeed Good for joining us. With you. Thank you. And a note, Penny Wong clarified at the end of that interview that she spoke to the head of UNRWA, Philippe Lazzarini, yesterday.